Some snow in Santa Fe, Dan? Oh, uh, we got a couple of flakes this morning. Nothing that's okay. stuck. Kind of neat, though. Yeah, the mountains here are beautiful, and it's a cloudy sky all, all around. Very that's nice, though. Yeah, I love this weather. <laughs> I could have gone my entire life without that that, that you just sent me. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's missing Denise. <laughs> mm. Denise, I had sent you a text uh, on Saturday. I wanted Ted, Ted's phone number. I didn't hear back from you. Call me after this is done, Dan. Okay. I the reason is that I was going to the isotopes game yesterday with a few folks and I wanted Ted to join us. So. Oh. Oh well. <laughs> well. We still got fifteen minutes. Is this hearing scheduled for ten fifteen? I saw it at ten fifteen. I'm gonna jump off. I got a couple things to do. I'm gonna oh. just uh break down uh Ah, okay. My
Good morning, everyone. This is Judge Michael Aragon. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Looks like we have Mr. Chavez and Mr. Rubin. Yes, sir. All righty. And Mr. Chavez, do we have your clients present? Uh, they're aware of it. I don't know that they're on. Okay. Uh, would we like to waive their appearance for purpose of today's hearing? It's my policy to give everybody five minutes if you want to try and contact them. Uh, this call is now being transcribed. Uh, I'll, I'll waive their appearance. If they appear, that's great. If not, I can, I'm prepared to go forward, Your Honor. Okay. Let's go ahead and call the matter. Court is convening in State of New Mexico for Judicial District Court, County of San Miguel. We're here in the matter of Allison and Christy Rose Martinez petitioners versus the New Mexico Racing Commission respondent. District Court cause number D-412-CV-2024-00084. Appearances for the record, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Gene Chavez appearing on behalf of the petitioners. Good morning, Your Honor. Daniel Rubin from the New Mexico Department of Justice on behalf of the New Mexico Racing Commission. Good morning, Council. Welcome and thank you for being here this morning. Council, before we get started, I just wanted to place on the record uh, that uh, Mr. Chavez and I are classmates. We graduated from UNM School of Law in 1999, and I had served as a local personal representative for one of Mr. Chavez's cases approximately eight, ten years ago. Mr. Chavez, I, I didn't get a chance to go back and look at my records, but I, I do remember it was the Astorga case where I served as a personal representative uh, for Mr. Chavez's law firm. Uh, I don't feel I have a conflict in this case, but I did want to place that on the record. Um, Mr. Chavez, Mr. Rubin, um, if you feel there's a, a conflict, I'll be more than happy to recuse. Um, that has been kind of the extent that Mr. Chavez and I have had, uh, and it's been it's been a number of years. I could pull out the actual date of when that case was finalized, but I know it's been at least eight years. It's 2011, Your Honor. 2011? Yes, finalized okay. in 2012. Mr. Rubin, um, would you like an opportunity to meet and confer? Um, uh, Your Honor, I, if I could briefly confer, we can take about a five-minute break. I just... I do feel like I owe my clients the opportunity to, as they're on, as they're attending today. Absolutely. I think what I just heard, it's like we could take a five minute recess. Absolutely, not a problem. Uh, council, I have 1017. Uh, I'll go ahead and convene in uh, 1022. Okay, council, we're off the record. Thank, Thank you. you.
This call is now being transcribed. Okay, welcome back, Council. Let's go and go back on the record. We're reconvening in cause number D-412-CV-2024-00086. Uh, Mr. Rubin, did you have an opportunity to meet and confer with your client, or do you need any additional time? Uh, we did meet and confer, Your Honor. We are fine with proceeding this morning. Okay. Mr. Chavez? Uh, no issue, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Chavez, we are here on your verified uh, petition for a preliminary and a... Um, a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction. Are you ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Chavez, you may proceed. Thank you, uh, Judge. In this particular uh, proceeding, the uh, horse owner and trainer of uh, my clients, uh, they received a summary suspension from the New Mexico Racing Commission. And with a summary suspension, they're allowed to get a hearing within 10 days. Uh, that was started, unfortunately, due to some circumstances which are beyond the control of uh, my clients, the matter was continued for about at least 60 days. And finally, there is an adjudication uh, from the Racing Commission, from the stewards. Uh, an appeal was filed uh, by my clients after that with a request for a stay uh, from the, uh, the commissioner of the, uh, the Racing Commission to stay the matter so that uh, my clients could enjoy the use of their license for both uh, training and ownership and entering uh, a horse. That was denied. So at this point, as has happened many times with the New Mexico Racing Commission, uh, the petitioners are at the mercy of waiting for the Racing Commission to set an administrative hearing in front of a hearing officer. Oftentimes that is set and it could be anywhere from 60, 90, 120 days from the day we get notice that's when we get a setting. So in the meantime, the petitioners are without any remedy to utilize their, uh, their license. This has been taken up uh, many times by district courts. This has been taken up many times uh, in similar circumstances of which sometimes uh, I have been successful in court granting the TRO, sometimes with a bond. There have been times that I was denied a TRO saying that the court lacks jurisdiction. And there was a recent court of appeals opinion I'm happy to share that with the court in which the court of appeals indicated that there was um, no abuse of discretion in the uh, district court denying a TRO, but that there was other opportunities or other avenues in which uh, petitioners in this case uh, could act. And so today we're asking for the uh, restraining order preliminary injunction, which would allow the, uh, the petitioners in this case to train horses and enter their horses or horse uh, pending the uh, outcome of this uh, this case. If this court requires a bond, they're happy to pay it. There's safeguards in place. So if something happens going forward, uh, the adjudicatory process will start for any kind of disciplinary matters. In the alternative, should the court decide not to, we would uh, then reserve the ability to file a writ for mandamus for this court to uh, ask an inferior court, which would be the administrative hearing, to set this within a certain amount of, of time and allow the, the proceeding to be speedy because the uh, the privilege of using their their license is, is certainly a privilege and it uh, it is one that they take very serious and it is part of their livelihood and i believe they're on the line if the court would like to discuss uh, any any kind of adverse consequences of not being able to uh, race or enter or train their horses as hat on them but in the meantime uh, we would ask this court to uh, grant our motion Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Rubin? Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. As a, as a preliminary matter, as reflected in the affidavit of Ms. Elizabeth Garcia, which we filed on Friday with our response, uh, there was only a, an appeal and a request for stay from the steward's decision by Ms. Allison Martinez. Uh, Ms. Christy Rose Martinez did not do so. She failed to do so. And so for the reason stated in our response, she has not exhausted her administrative 
remedies and uh, she is not a proper uh, she should be dismissed uh, from this from this proceeding and depending on how this this court rules on the other issues we may need a separate uh, ruling on that point but i will proceed uh, regardless um, so as as your honor probably knows we have the procedure as as and also as mr chavez has discussed uh, there is a hearing in front of the stewards a body appointed by the commission stewards who know the industry and they make a ruling based upon an initial hearing uh, that occurred in this case uh, the stay from that decision was denied by the executive director uh, and so i think the most important place to start uh, on, a, on a tro application is with the fourth prong uh, that the petitioners are cannot show that they're likely to prevail on the merits of this case uh, they've raised two issues in their petition before this court the first is notice and your honor we have attached to Ms. Ms. Garcia's affidavit the notice that was provided. There were no specifics whatsoever in the petition uh, as to how this notice failed to give them the due process they were entitled to pursuant to the rule, uh, nor uh, is there any, nor was there any deviation from what they were entitled to. So other than sort of a, a blank argument by Mr. Chavez, there's nothing there on the notice issue. Uh, the other issue raised by Mr. Chavez a little more interesting perhaps is the hearsay. Uh, Mr. Chavez claims uh, that the steward's decision uh, is improper because it relied it relied completely upon hearsay. Uh, I think the party, and as reflected in the pleadings, we both agree that uh, the residuum rule requires some admissible evidence uh, to support administrative decision. In some cases that can include uh, admissible hearsay. Uh, no no issue that our rule says uh, there must be some non-hearsay but honor in this case uh, as reflected in the affidavit of Ms. garcia there was plenty of non-hearsay evidence before the stewards uh, to be specific first we had the vet narrative as to the sampling procedures that occurred with the horse we then also had the lab the lab supervisor testify as to the testing procedures both of those both of those witnesses provided personal knowledge and pers and testimony based upon that personal knowledge it was not hearsay now of course there is a test result that was submitted by at the stewards hearing that by itself would be hearsay uh, but based upon the testimony of the lab of the lab technician that that report was at a minimum uh, would suffice under the business records exception. Uh, but the mo more important point is that yes, there was plenty of testimony. Um, I, we certainly understand the intent of that rule. We can't just show up with a piece of paper and say we win piece of paper. Can't cross examine a piece of paper, and we and they didn't do that. As as Miss Garcia attests to in her affidavit, she's the investigator. She presented the case. They, she had two witnesses. I don't know what what else the commission what could have been presented if they don't have the vet, they don't have the 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 lab technician. That's everything, Your Honor. So the hearsay argument is completely without merit, and that's all there is in the petition. So um, I just note in passing that there's nothing that even says that in the petition that says that they didn't do what they did. We have a positive result for albuterol, a serious, serious offense in the in the world of racing. Uh, so that's the first prong. I think we should be entitled to prevail simply on the fact that they are not likely, they haven't shown any likelihood prevailing on the merits of this case. Uh, and Mr. Chavez today has not even argued the merits. Uh, if your honor wishes though, I can put on uh, the testimony, I'll be about five, 10 minutes of our executive director uh, Isabel Trejo, uh, he can testify as to the public interest. He can testify as to how it outweighs the temporary suspension of a license. Um, if, if that is, and so I, I would ask for your honor's pleasure on that point. Okay. Um, you may, we can, Mr. Trejo, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera and unmuting yourself. Good morning, your honor. 
Good morning, Mr. Trejo. Welcome and thank you for being here this morning. Mr. Trejo, if you could please raise your right hand. Mr. Trejo, do you swear and affirm that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rubin, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Executive Trejo, Executive, <laughs> Executive Director Trejo, how long have you been Executive Director? I have been the Executive Director since uh, approximately March uh, 26, 2016. 2016, approximately seven years? Yes. Going okay. on eight. Mm -hmm. and, and prior to being serving as executive director, did you work elsewhere in the field of horse racing? Yes, I have extensive background in, in the horse racing industry. Uh, uh, going back to my very, very, very young days, uh, traveling the country with my father and uh, working from uh, very uh, menial jobs as uh, hot walking horses, grooming horses, cleaning stalls, um, uh, to management, um, becoming a racing official, a regulator. Uh, so uh, certainly have the perspective on the industry um, from a lot of different areas. Thank you, Director. So based upon your experience, uh, your, your wealth of experience over the, sounds like decades in the horse racing industry, what would you say is probably the biggest challenge, the biggest concern to New Mexico horse racing today? Well, coming into New Mexico from uh, other jurisdictions, uh, the, the uh, New Mexico certainly had a reputation of being the wild, wild west. Uh, when I use that terminology, it was due to the illicit use of, of drugs on horses, uh, causing horses to die and so forth, and uh, cheating the betting public and the other fair playing participants. Um, so I would say focus number one when I arrived in town was to focus on the, um, the illicit drug use on these animals to try to protect the animals a lot more than uh, what had been in the prior years. So we've implemented some uh, good testing programs uh, to the to uh, the agency and uh, the, we feel that they've been quite successful in trying to alleviate these trainers from um, trying to gain an unfair advantage uh, from the fair playing people and, uh, and then once again uh, cheating the betting public because those are two of our, our most uh, highest priorities is to make sure the game is played as fair as possible to ensure that the public will want to wager their dollars on our industry as uh, they do support our industry. So it's our job to try to give them the fairest game possible. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Director. Um, next question is, well, you're, you're not a veterinarian, are you? No, I'm not. And you have no formal medical training? I do not. Okay. Based upon your experience, do you have uh, do you have any uh, knowledge as to what the uh, what how the industry considers uh, the use of albuterol, why it's used, what the problems are with albuterol used in horses? Well, specifically uh, for quarter horses, and uh, we, we certainly want to keep the line drawn between thoroughbreds and quarter horse. And I believe the horse in question in this case was a quarter horse. Um, uh, the drug albuterol is a fine uh, fine drug to use for uh, breathing problems uh, if it's used through an aerosol uh, when it's injected or, or uh, administered orally uh, through a liquid. Um, it works uh, similar to uh, steroids. Um, it is a bronchodilator, but uh, people have found that it, uh, it is a beta agonist that can uh, uh, enhance muscle build, build up and the disposable of, uh, disposal of fat tissues. So uh, you get a leaner, um, stronger horse competing against horses that have not been administered this drug. Um, so so it, it certainly can give you an advantage. Struven, do you mind if I ask a question? I, I, I'm, I have to admit I'm, I'm not familiar with this area. I'm not familiar with um, racing industry. But there was something that you said that piqued my interest the distinction between a quarter horse and a thoroughbred yes uh th there have been studies by the american quarter horse association that i and i apologize your honor that i don't go quite into detail because my lack of um familiarity with scientific terminology but it has something to do that with the the muscle buildup of a quarter horse is different than a thoroughbred and um these drugs have a 
different effect on these horse on quarter horses than they do thoroughbreds, which is why the Association of Racing Commissioners International has um, <clears throat> given the uh, on the uniform classification of uh, I forgot what it's called. There's they have a formal document that it's in our rule book used uh, in reference. Uh, albuterol is a class three A, and that means it's a class three drug with a A penalty, which is this most strongest, severest penalty that we can give to a horseman. Uh, and um, so for thoroughbreds, it is a class three B, which is um, a penalty of thousand dollar fine and 15 day suspension for a first time violation. That's what's recommended. And I go back to the quarter horse being a three A, that's a minimum one year suspension and I believe a $10,000 fine. So there's been some scientific study behind it, which causes the Association of Racing Commissioners International, which is the uh, regulator organization that creates model rules for the industry to divvy different penalties for one breed over another breed. Interesting. I, I'm i going back to, the, you know, a horse is a horse, of course, of course, is the only thing that popped into my mind. I would have never thought that there was a distinction between uh, a quarter horse and a thoroughbred. So thank you for educating me on that. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, he educated me as well, because as someone with asthma, I was very disturbed to hear that albuterol was an issue. Uh, we had these had these horrible health effects because I take I, it every day. I, I I saw that in the petition and I just pictured a huge inhaler that is, but so <laughs> once again, I, I want on the record, I, this is something that I'm not familiar with. This is my first encounter with the racing commission in terms of the administrative code. So please bear with me. And if I ask questions that uh, may seem out of left field, I'm just trying to fully understand the process. So Mr. Rubin, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, in this case, uh, Director Trejo, uh, you were requested uh, to have this, the effects of the steward, the, the prohibition on the license, the suspension of the license by the stewards uh, stayed. Is that correct? That is correct. And what did you do in reviewing the request for a stay? I decided to deny the stay. And um, what did you do before you denied? What did you review before denying that stay? Well, we reviewed the, the paperwork submitted and, on, and I listened to the the hearing and one thing that uh, that was listed on the appeal paperwork was that uh, there was allegations that the official sample was compromised and also there was allegations that the split sample was compromised and the third piece i believe was that uh, we depended on hearsay evidence in listening to the hearing uh, i did not hear any testimony to um, to support those three facts. Um, the, the, there was some, if I recall correctly, um, there were some allegations that the stewards were using hearsay evidence, but that was on the split sample uh, paperwork. Uh, and I, I believe we were prosecuting the official sample during that hearing. So uh, we found that the chain of custody was intact. Uh, the sample arrived at the official laboratory of the New Mexico Racing Commission. Um, in good condition, which is verified, I believe, on the um, analysis report. And so if there was anything that was visibly uh, deemed to be compromised, the official laboratory would notify the Racing Commission and we would make a decision whether we want to proceed. Um, and we were not given any indication, but to the contrary, we were given clear indication that the sample arrived in good shape and they proceeded with the testing, which produced a finding of albuterol. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I have no further questions. I pass the witness. Okay. Um, and I guess just on a follow-up, Mr. Trejo, um, what is the process to determine whether the specimen was received from a quarter horse or a thoroughbred? Is there some documentation as to the lineage of the horse? Or how is that determined? Um, Your Honor, let me just think a bit because I'm not always involved in the testing process, but we do have a test card and I can't say for sure that the breed of the horse is indicated 
on that test card. And that test card goes along with the matching number uh, on it, uh, consistent with what's on the actual sample. I, I believe it may be put on there. Um, but so, uh, okay. I think okay. that's that's where it's indicated. Plus, with the name of the horse and the horse's uh, identification number, which uh, traditionally had been a, a lip tattoo, they tattoo the horse with a, a number in their upper mm -hmm. lip. And when you flip it, you could read it. Uh, a quarter horse's identification number is different than a thoroughbred identification number. So there's another way that you can differentiate between a thoroughbred. But the when it comes down to it, if the drug is there, it's there. If it's in the thoroughbred, it's just a different penalty. If it's in a quarter horse, it's a different penalty. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Trejo. Mr. Yes, Rubin, sir. any follow-up based on the court's questioning? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Chavez, cross-examination. Uh, Mr. Chavez, I went ahead and muted you. We're getting a little bad background, so I apologize. <clears throat> no problem. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Trejo. Good morning, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Trejo, do you know the difference between a nanogram and a picogram? Well, I've never been uh, the expert on math, but uh, there there is a different difference, and it is very finite. Do you know... Uh, in layman's terms, if we were to describe to the court how much in is in a nanogram, would you be able to describe it? Nanogram, we've always used the the uh, analogy. It's just like a, a, a it, it's so it's very minor. It's so minute. It's a looks like a, if a grain of salt was cut into ten thousand pieces, would that be a nanogram? Do you understand? Yeah, fair assumption. I, I I don't know if that's exact, but fair assumption. It's it's small. It's a small dose. Okay. And in this case, we're dealing with nanograms. Isn't that correct? I don't recall uh, the level that was found. Uh, and with clenbuterol, uh, it is a level of detection. So if the laboratories detect it, it is a finding, and no matter how small it is. So if the laboratory equipment picks it up, they will report it, uh, no matter how small it is, and it, it, it is a finding. And that's the absolute insurer rule, so that if there's any amount regardless of how minuscule the racing commission prosecutes, correct? If the laboratory, the official laboratory calls it and sends us a affidavit, then yes, we will pursue with prosecution. Correct. Regardless of whether or not there's any testimony from, actually strike that. Uh, is there anyone that you're aware of from the racing commission that provides testimony as to whether or not any findings of nanograms has any uh, effect or performance enhancing effect on any of the horses not on my staff but that is what our official chemist who's under contract with the commission uh, with the industrial laboratories in colorado they testify on our behalf as to all the science right they testify as to the sciences to the findings but my understanding is that all my cross examinations of them they can't opine as to whether or not a tiny piece of a grain of sand would have any effect on the performance of a horse your Honor, objection. That's not a proper question. He's referring to testimony that's not before the court today. Sustained. Is there is there anyone on this particular case that came in and testified as to what effect any nanograms would have had of an illicit substance on the performance of a horse, Mr. Trail? I I don't know that anyone testified to that. I I don't recall hearing that. All right, and to the best of your knowledge, uh, the New Mexico Horsemen's Association used to assist with the collection of split samples. Isn't that correct? Statutorily, they're supposed to assist in, in it, but uh, we received a letter indicating that they no longer want to be part of it for um, some specific reasons. Right, but I want to clarify for the court who, who um, I want to make sure he understands exactly the process. Ordinarily, when there is a sample taken by the New Mexico Racing Commission, there is an opportunity afforded to the licensee to obtain a split sample, and that's a second opinion from a different testing facility. Isn't that true? Uh, split sample laboratories used for a secondary analysis. Okay. And there are specific rules, procedures, and guidelines in the New Mexico Administrative Code as to how those split samples are supposed to be collected and stored. Isn't that true? Yes. 
it's in okay. statute. And the Horseman's Association used to assist. The Horseman's Association is a different entity than the Racing Commission. Isn't that true? That is correct. Okay. And so for many years, the Horseman's Association would send a representative to assist in the collection of the split sample and, and assist in the chain of custody. Isn't that true? Uh, they, they would ride down to the lab and uh, pursuant to our rules, our, uh, one of our representatives would grasp the uh, sample and uh, take it from the rest of the samples and, and place it into a shipping container. Uh, I, I don't know that they were there for observation. That'd be a better question for uh, one of our investigators that uh, uh, does this uh, throughout the year. But um, it was sealed, the package is sealed there. And then uh, that the wasn't horse, my question, Mr. Trejo. Or so the Horseman's Association would ride with us to the uh, packing facility or, or shipping facility. And now the Horseman's Association has absolutely no involvement with the collection of storage or shipment of any of the uh, split samples. Isn't that true? Well, they've never had any role in the shipping and storage of the split sample, but in the uh, shipping they would go and be the representative for the horsemen and uh, i that, think that was my question mr trejo they're no longer doing anything with the split samples isn't that your true? honor yeah your honor if he if mr. chavez would be would allow the witness to finish his answer it was a responsive answer it wasn't hold on i'll go ahead and allow just mr trejo so you can educate me as to uh, this is all new to me so yeah the the, the horsemen have uh, withdrawn themselves from the process so in this particular case with the horsemen, the horsemen have withdrawn their process. The administrative prosecutor, Mr. Richard Bustamante, was a part of the chain of custody for the split sample. Isn't that true? I don't believe he was. Uh, Mr. Bustamante merely went for a uh, ride along with the investigator to see how the process works since the commission is now doing playing an important role in offering the horsemen uh, their right to a split sample, whereas it, uh, the commission could have just dropped this and said, well, you don't get a split sample because the horseman withdrew from the process. But we felt it's so important for the, the trainer, the licensee to uh, keep that right afforded to them. So we very quickly put into in a process in which the commission was going to be playing the role of the horseman as well and helping the trainer out and seeking a laboratory that would accept the split sample. So uh, I believe that Mr. Bustamante, our in-house counsel, merely went to observe the process. So he knows how it works. He didn't sign off on anything or indicate on any of the split sample chain of custodies that uh, anything he witnessed? I don't remember that he signed off in, on any paperwork. He, he was merely there to watch the investigator um, roll out this new process that we have. So if he was there just to observe, who was uh, tasked by the New Mexico Racing Commission to ensure that the split sample that was obtained, stored, and shipped uh, was in accordance with the split sample chain of custody collection and shipment as noted in uh, the Mexico Administrative Code. Well, it's my understanding that the uh, investigator, Miss Elizabeth Garcia, was there to represent the commission, and I would only assume that uh, trainer Martinez had a representative to uh, observe the process as well. Your Honor, if I may object to any further line of questioning here, this is getting very far afield from what's before the court on a TRO. Now, of course, Mr. Chavez is well within his rights to question these witnesses uh, at, at a hearing, but these are this is going into matters that are certainly, they go to the weight of the, of the evidence, but not the admissibility. And the admiss what is before the court is whether the the residual rule, the hearsay rule, was satisfied. That is a rule of admissibility. This is all going to the weight of the evidence. And I, I fail to see, I certainly got a certain amount of latitude, um, but I fail to see how this should continue. Thank you. Mr. Chavez, brief response. Response is, Your Honor, is that uh, one of the prongs of the temporary restraining order preliminary injunction is the likelihood of success on the merits and the basis on this case as pointed out by the racing commission is that we have some severe concerns with the chain of custody i 
cross-examined the vet who gave us an indication that she had absolutely no participation in the chain of custody form whatsoever. So Jackson, your as, Honor, there's no evidence before the court. That's just argument. So, so Mr. Chavez, as, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Chavez, go ahead and finish your thought. Uh, yeah, so we want to give the court a background as to not necessarily proving to you. I, I think that in, as contemplated by the TRO uh, and preliminary injunction standard is that we have to show the court that there is a high likelihood of success based upon our review and based upon my past experiences and wins with the Racing Commission on this very issue. I think that it is paramount that this court understand that we have a, an argument. We have an argument that has been uh, prevailed on several times in the past as to whether or not the Racing Commission follows its administrative codes to the T. So the reason that I asked those questions of Mr. Trejo, who is the administrative, I'm sorry, the um, uh, representative for the New Mexico Racing Commission that was brought in to testify to this is his knowledge and understanding as to uh, his decision to deny the, the stay. And based on what he knows, we, we want to discuss that. I'm happy to move on a few other topics, but I did want to go into uh, detail as to why we b believe that the likelihood of us prevailing on the case in chief is important for this court to understand why we're asking for the TRO. Thank you, Mr. Chavez, and I appreciate that. I think, Mr. Rubin, I think that was one of the initial prongs and in likelihood of success, but I would agree that, Mr. Rubin, this is more in line for the uh, merits hearing on a um, preliminary injunction. So I'm going to ask that you move along. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, the next question I have is, Mr. Trejo, uh, there is a uh, council earlier made reference to notice. Are you aware of the notice that was provided uh, in this in this case to the uh, trainer and the uh, owner? At the stewards level, Mr. Chavez? Is that what you at, any at any level. I have not, I've not seen the notice. Okay, because we received notice on several time, uh, several instances in which I'll have Ms. Uh, Martinez testify that Ms. Allison Martinez, who is the owner of the horses, I'm sorry, the trainer of the horses, uh, received multiple notices and, and multiple, um, uh, let's see, findings from the uh, Racing Commission, but I don't recall seeing a single notice that went out on behalf of the uh, actual owner of the, of the horses. To your knowledge, do you know, do you know if that was sent? Objection, Your Honor. First of all, it's not, it's, it's not a properly formulated question. You made it an issue. You hold made on. it an hold issue on, when Mr. you Chavez. said- Chavez, hold on. Mr. Rubin, finish your objection. Thank you. I object on several grounds, Your Honor. He's referring to matter evidence not before the court. There's no foundation for much of what he is asking. Uh, and he's asked about three or four questions uh, in that long rambling paragraph. I could go into further detail, but I ask that he break it up and not refer to other cases or what his, te what his client might testify to. So you can testify separately, but that's not a proper foundational question. Thank Mr. You. Thomas, I'm going to ask that you tighten it up a little bit just so I can track properly in terms of the notice. Uh, I think we're, I'm tracking that there was notice sent to the trainer and then the issue as to whether it was sent to the owner and the um, uh, licensee, correct? Correct. Okay, so go ahead and tighten it up. Mr. Rubin, your objection is sustained. Mr. Chavez, go ahead. You may continue. Uh, thank you. So the the rulings, Mr. Trejo, are, are you familiar? Do you have any, any involvement in the rulings? No, I, I did not have any involvement in this ruling. Are, are you aware of the, uh, let, me, let me backtrack. When you make a decision to either grant a stay or deny a stay, do you look at the rulings to see what uh, has transpired at the Stewart's uh, hearing level? Yeah, I do, but I, I don't recall exactly the penalty that uh, Ms. Martinez was given. Right, I understand that. But in, in the rulings, the, the, the rulings specifically list, for example, the ruling number, the track, and the ruling date. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir, I do agree with that. And would you agree with me that the licensee, the name of the person who holds the license, is also listed on those rulings, correct? Yes. Okay. And is it your testimony that in this particular situation, in your review of a stay, you looked at the rulings to uh, positively affirm that the licensee at issue was uh, Allison Judith Martinez? I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the middle name, uh, uh, familiar with the first name and the last name. Yes. Allison. Okay. All right. Great. 
And would you agree with me that none of these rulings listed the licensee of uh, Christy Martinez? Would you agree with that? Um, she would have a separate ruling um, in these medication violations or drug violations. The the owner gets a ruling, which was a uh, Christy Rose, and then the trainer, Miss Allison Martinez, got her own ruling. And those rulings would be sent out around the same time. Yes, uh, they should be. Yep. Um, I mean, there's no rule that says that, but uh, we we need to get these rulings out uh, because of the. Uh, uh, opportunity to appeal and the time clock ticking on that uh, 10 days. Have you seen any of the rulings uh, by the stewards uh, that are specific to the licensee, Christy Rose Martinez? I've probably seen it. Yep. Okay. More than likely, I've seen it. <clears throat> I have not. Objection, Your Honors. That a question? Ms. No, I'll strike, that. I'll strike that. I think that's all the questions I have for the uh, for the racing commissioner. Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Rubin, any redirect? Um, just a few questions, um, Director Trejo. Uh, Mr. Richard Bustamante was referred to as the administrative prosecutor by Mr. Chavez. Is Mr. Bustamante the administrative prosecutor of the Racing Commission? He can be. Okay. Oh. He, has, he act, has he acted as, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were finished. No, go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Rubin. Okay. Has he acted as the prosecutor in any capacity in this case? I don't recall. Okay. Um, okay, nothing further, Your Honor, thank you. Um. Hmm. Okay. I guess, Mr. Thoreau, maybe I have a couple questions because uh, I was w wondering what Mr. Bustamante's role in all of this. And it seems like the uh, Horsemen's Association initially was maybe like an independent party to view the chain of custody for these collection samples. Is that, is that my understanding? Yeah, by statute, uh, they, they were involved in, uh, in, in helping out their constituents, which would be Ms. Martinez. If uh, Ms. Martinez was notified of a violation, um, she would contact them. They would then in turn contact the approved accredited labs that the commission has approved to see which one would take her uh, split sample, which is a secondary sample. Uh, we, we had received notification from them uh, right around the same time that they're no longer going to be part of it. So the commission, including our, uh, our in-house counsel and our investigators and stewards um, met and came up with a game plan that would uh, help preserve the trainer's opportunity to have a split sample. Uh, we, we wanted to be sure that we kept this process alive instead of just saying, you know what, the horsemen aren't helping you anymore. We're not going to help you. We're kicking you to the curb. We're just going to prosecute on the official sample. But um, Mr. Bustamante helped in creating the, the process. He went down on a ride. And I may have been mistaken. I, I, and forgive me, Your Honor. I don't know which investigator he went with, whether it was Ms. Garcia or our other investigator, Arthur Pierre. Uh, but Mr. Bustamante merely went down to watch process so he would be uh, more familiar with it. Um, and, and we thought that was a good idea um, that he, he has knowledge of watching this game plan that we put on paper play out um, in real life. So so his that was his role that day was merely to go with the investigator to observe it. Interesting. And if if they were statutorily required to be a part of this process and they just decided at some point we're not, is it? it, it just seems you have the to use the term a prosecutor witnessing the collection and possibly, it, it, I don't know if he was prosecuting this case or if he was just there as an independent witness, but it just appears to me that the Horsemen's Association may have been there as an independent uh, arbiter and witness to the uh, collection of the sample. Is that my understanding? Well, that a fair that, understanding, I guess. That, that was their role, but a trainer at any time can go be their own representative. And I understand that that happened in this case, that uh, 
Martinez, she could go there and watch the um, extraction of the sample from the uh, stored uh, freezer at the laboratory to uh, retrieve it. She watches, she, she watches the investigator pull it from the bag, put it into the shipping container, sealed wrap, they go to FedEx, ship it. If anything was wrong, I would think she would say something at that time, like, hey, why, why is the in, uh, why is the attorney handling that sample? Bustamante was just in the room, from what I understand. He was just merely there to watch. Um, and I think it was a, a, a good move by the commission to have our in-house counsel watch the process play out uh, because him not being a racing guy and not ever hold on hold on hold on so mr Mar mr bustamante's general counsel he's our in-house counsel yeah doesn't that kind of raise an well mr rubin maybe i'm going down a slippery slope to me that almost seems almost like an ethical issue in terms of being a potential witness to the collection i, I i'm just thinking in terms of like my background is criminal, Mr. Rubin, so I'm just thinking in terms of a, uh, a district attorney going down to a crime scene. I've always seen that as problematic because they are a potential witness and their credibility could come into question. So Mr. Bustamante is a licensed attorney with the Gaming Commission? Your Honor, the, the answer I anticipated from, from Director Trejo was Mr. Bustamante is general counsel to the commission. I was not aware, and I don't think he has a as a prosecutorial role in front of the commission. The way it works is the attorney, the Department of Justice for the AG's office has a separate division, not my division, a, has a prosecutor from that division prosecute the case in front of the commission. Mr. Bustamante never figures into that. It is a prosecutor from the AG's office, separate from myself, because I also provide counsel to the commission, but as Your Honor may be aware, we have separate divisions and we keep up the a, a very a serious wall between us. I never talk to the prosecutor, uh, and he never he or she never talks to me. Um, so, Director Trejo, I may want to clarify that statement. Um, I also, based on your line of questioning, Your Honor, I, I think we need to be clear that if I could ask the question of this witness, did split sampling occur? And based upon his viewing of the of of the video transcript, I think he can answer that question. Absolutely, Mr. Trejo, you may answer. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, when the question was asked, I wasn't clear on what level you're asking about prosecuting. Occasionally at the stewards level that uh, Mr. Bustamante can uh, assist one of the investigators in uh, some some um, cases. It's not, as it has not happened very often. Uh, at the prosecutor, at the prosecuting level, at the district um, hearing officer level, the Mr. Bustamante, I don't believe has uh, prosecuted a a whole lot. I mean, we would be very clear to keep the lines, the lines very clear on what case he's handling, and that he wouldn't be involved. We have um, the AG's office represent us at the hearing officer level, and then at the district level. Um, the Department of Justice has a representative for us to to uh, handle our matters there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Trejo. But I think Mr. Rubin was asking specifically whether there was a split sample that was done in this case. Yes, Your Honor. The, a split sample was was taken at the test barn, and it was uh, sent off by at the request of Ms. Martinez. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, so was Ms. Martinez or a representative of Ms. Martinez present when the split sample was was taken? I can't testify to that. That would be a better uh, question for uh, the investigator okay. that was uh, there. I, I would assume so. I know we send out the times in which we can meet them and go, but I, I don't want to assume an answer yes to, to this. And I just have one last question, just for my own curiosity. Is this like a blood sample that is drawn from the horse or, or what type of sample? What does a sample consist of, I guess? Just well, for my benefit. Uh, Post-race samples traditionally are urine samples or blood samples. And the samples are taken immediately after the race within usually traditionally an, an hour or so after the race while the horse cools out from his, his performance. And then, the official sample 
is sent to industrial laboratories, our official laboratory in Colorado, and our split sample is sent to SLD labs in Albuquerque immediately. And uh, when a trainer requests a split sample, uh, the investigator coordinates a time in which the trainer or the representative can go to the laboratory, SLD laboratory, to retrieve the sample, package it off, and send it to a split sample laboratory that's been approved by the commission. Mm -hmm. so, right. so the, uh, and I'm not sure what you were thinking there that uh, we go pull another sample from directly from the horse for the split sample. I wasn't sure if that's what you were thinking, but. Well, no, that, so what was, was it urine or blood taken in this specific case? I don't recall exactly what, what, what it was. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thurman. Like I say, just for my own benefit, Mr. Rubin, any uh, follow-up based on the court's questioning? Uh, no, Your Honor, nothing, nothing further. Mr. Chavez, any uh, follow-up regarding the court's questioning? Yes, uh, Mr. Trejo, you're familiar with the New Mexico Administrative Codes, correct? As good as I can be, yes. And would you agree with me that I know you don't have it in front of me, but does it sound accurate that specifically section 15 to 610 subpart D four has to do with uh, the collection of split samples. We do have a section in our rule book that uh, um, does refer to the split sample process. Okay. And Well, Your Honor, is it possible for me to share my screen here for that administrative code so that Mr. Trejo is working off of what he can see as opposed to his memory? Absolutely. That way I can see it as well. Certainly. Okay. Then with the, court, with the court's permission, if I can share my screen, I'll, I'll put that on there. I'm familiar with 15.2610, but not D or 4. I'm just kidding. I'm not familiar with that section at all, so <laughs> that would be beneficial for the court as well. Okay, let's see here. And Mr. Rubin, just, um, I think this is in line with the court's questioning regarding the collection samples. So once again, I think this would be beneficial to the court. I've never seen this administrative code as well. Is my screen shared, Your Honor? It is, yes, sir. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna scroll down a little bit here. This shows the administrative code uh, number. It's uh, in the top 15, 2, 6, 10, testing. And I'm going to scroll down to subpart D. I'll stop it right there under D. This section, Your Honor, is, is specific to split samples. And I, I'd like to focus on subpart D4. And that says that prior to the opening of a split sample freezer or any other secure split sample storage mechanism, the commission shall ensure that the standard operating procedure for the handling and shipping of the split sample are followed and documented standard operating procedure for the handling and shipping of a split sample shall include documentation of the following at a minimum and these next i, I won't read them all i think the, the court can take a look at them mr trejo would you agree with me that the new mexico racing commission if you take a look at your screen there subpart four has to be able to document and show that each and every one of these criteria is is met and followed out Yes. Okay. And it's also your testimony in this particular situation that there was no member from the Horsemen's Association that would have assisted on behalf of the uh, owner. I, I don't believe there was, but uh, the trainer doesn't have, they can have a representative, maybe not someone quote unquote from the NMHA, the New Mexico Horsemen's Association, but a trainer can represent themselves or send someone else to represent them. In this case, I, I as I testified earlier, I don't know if Miss Martinez was there herself. Um, I would assume it was her, but uh, but I don't know. Okay. And is it also your understanding? Well, let me let me backtrack. Did you listen to any of the uh, hearing uh, in this case with Miss uh, Martinez in front of the uh, stewards? Yes, I did. Okay. Were you aware that I asked the uh, official veterinarian that came in to testify as to her involvement with the uh, sp official split sample chain of custody form? I don't remember hearing that. Do you remember me asking her and she said she had absolutely no part uh, in drafting that? 
um, the chain of custody or the paperwork? The chain of custody specific to the split sample form. I, I didn't know you were talking about the split sample. Uh, yeah. I think that was a uh, just the chain of custody. I wasn't sure if you're referring to the official sample or the split sample, but uh, most of the majority of the split sample disc uh, discussion came at the end with uh, no veterinarian or no chemist uh, around. Okay, let's let's uh, let's look at uh, subpart six. It says the owner, trainer, or designee shall pack the split sample for shipment in the presence of a representative of a commission of the commission. I'm sorry. Mr. Trejo, would you agree with me that pursuant to the New Mexico Administrative Code, somebody that is affiliated with the licensee is to pack the split sample in the presence of the Racing Commission? Yeah, yeah that's what it says there. And, um, right. And, and your testimony today is you have no idea if Ms. Uh, Martinez was there uh, to go do that on on her own because the uh, the horsemen's association was not there to assist her is that correct your honor uh, let me object to this line of questioning again mr director trejo has already testified he was not there we have we have with us the investigator if mr if uh, mr chavez wishes that information from her we already know what the what this witness knows and he can testify as to what the interpretation of the rules but beyond that in this particular case it's it's there's no foundation for his answers brief reply mr chavez well i think mr trail had said he assumed if, if he's willing to say that uh, he assumed that basically is the crux of our argument in all of this is that the racing commission made a lot of assumptions of which they can't do your honor and that's the basis for our request for this tro and uh preliminary injunction so if, if mr trejo's uh answer uh, as he stated before is that he assumes i'm, I'm fine with that okay thank you mr chavez and i think that's a little bit outside the scope of what the court had initially uh, was asking of Mr. Trejo. So let's go ahead and move on. I think that's more of a merits hearing, uh, you know, requiring much more evidentiary testimony. So, it, Mr. You're, Chavez. Yes, you're hundred percent right. Once again, this just goes to our argument on the, on the merits and the likelihood of success, your honor, but I will certainly um, move along. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, I think the better person to ask on some of the questions regarding the notice I would ask, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll ask uh, uh, Ms. Martinez uh, briefly. So, Your Honor, with your permission, I'll, I'll, I'll end my screen sharing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, I have no further questions of Mr. Trejo. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Uh, Ms. Rubin, may Mr. Trejo be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Trejo, thank you for your testimony this morning. I really do appreciate it. You're more than welcome to remain in the virtual courtroom. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. And Mr. Chavez, we kind of did things a little bit backwards. We probably should have put your case in chief uh, regarding the um, temporary and the TRO. Uh, but do you have any witnesses at this point? Yes, Your Honor. I have Allison Martinez, I like to call. And Ms. Martinez, um, if you could please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. I I couldn't get on um, on the camera. I'm on through, through the phone. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Mr. Rubin, any objection to Ms. Martinez appearing uh, only telephonically? Uh, no, Your Honor, that's fine. Uh, okay. No problem. No objection. It's, yeah. Sometimes it's a little hard to assess the credibility and make sure that there's not, you know, anyone else in the room. Ms. Martinez, is anyone else in the room with you? Uh, no, my daughter is in her bedroom, um, but she's um on the other side of the house, the house. Okay. no that's fine okay um miss martinez if you could please raise your right hand and let me know when it's raised it's raised miss martinez do you swear and affirm that the testimony given this matter will be the truth whole truth and nothing but the truth under penalty of perjury i do okay thank you mr chavez you may proceed thank you good morning miss martinez good morning miss martinez i'm we're we're taking testimony today to discuss with the court about your temporary restraining order preliminary injunction and some of the this earlier discussion we've had is we're focusing on the split sample. Can you describe to the court uh, what happened when you had asked for a split sample? Um, so do I start from the very beginning? Um, uh, 
Certainly, I'll walk when you. I I'll got, walk you down. Okay. I'll walk you down so it's so it's not so general. When when you when you Chavez, if you don't mind, let me just go ahead and get some preliminary. I should have done this at the beginning, but uh, Ms. Uh, Martinez, can you please give us your full name for the record? Yes, it's Allison Judith Martinez. And your date of birth? Uh, nine twenty eight eighty five. And the last four digits of your social security? One three eight four. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martinez. Just since you're appearing telephonically, uh, I want to confirm your identity. I have confirmed your identity for the purpose of the record, and I apologize, Mr. Chavez, for interrupting. You may proceed. Oh, no, no, no problem, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Martinez, when did you indicate to the Racing Commission that you would like a split sample taken? Um, I tried getting a hold, well, I tried getting a hold of uh, the New Mexico Horsemen's Association, um, and I couldn't get a hold of them. And I finally, because I was just so, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I finally messaged um, um, Liz and I actually do have her, I had texted her, so. When you say Liz, are you referring to Liz Garcia? Elizabeth, yes, Elizabeth Garcia is the investigator. Right. For, for clarification, Elizabeth Garcia is the investigator, was also the prosecutor in the uh, stewards hearing, Your Honor. Okay, duly noted, Mr. Chavez. Yeah. All right, and so when you contacted her, what happened? Um, she did give me, she, she, because I couldn't get a hold of the New Mexico horsemen. Nobody was in the office to answer. She gave me the phone number. I tried um, sending it, uh, getting a hold of them. And then um, a letter of uh, notice went out saying that they're no longer um, doing the split samples. So they, um, they, because you only have 48 hours to request the split sample, um, they did because of the confusion they allowed me to they still they allowed me to do it because I had already I was trying to to request a split sample but they weren't able to so um we were finally able to um schedule I scheduled with Liz to meet at the racing commission office um so we could drive over to the the scientific laboratory or wherever it's stored. I didn't know where it was stored. Um, um, we scheduled a date. She wasn't going to, Liz wasn't actually there. Elizabeth wasn't actually there. Um, I actually met with Arthur Pierre. Um, I'm sorry, with who? With, um, I believe his name is Arthur Pierre. The Pierre, the, um, the other investigator. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. And who else was and present? When, who else was present when you met with them to at the? Uh, when, well, when I got when I got to the I went into the office and um, he was um, Mr. Pierre was actually on his way out, um, carrying some cases and boxes. Him and I didn't know who it was at the time. I really I didn't they didn't introduce him. Um, it was it was Mr. Bustamante, um, who was with him um we we um we went together i left my car there we actually we got into his state vehicle his black truck um he we got in i got in the back seat um mr pierre was driving mr bustamante was passenger seat he pulled out a logbook and he docu he said he had to document where he was going um so we were went on our way to the laboratories where where um where Ms. Martinez, Ms. Martinez, can you just mm -hmm. tell me when you got there who was present uh it, it's uh mr pierre and uh, uh richard Bustamante. okay and did you uh, were you was anyone with you it was me my brand no it, well it was just us three myself mr he, Mr. Pierre and uh, Richard Bustamante. Okay, and did you pack it? Did you pack the split sample into an approved uh, container to be sent off for testing? Um, I didn't do it myself. Um, Mr. Mr. Pierre packed it. He he had the box. He um, he he unwrapped the sample. And you know, when they got it out of the freezer, he unwrapped it. He put it in the box. Um, he pulled a roll of scotch tape out of his pocket and taped it up 
and he handed me he handed me the box and a copy of the the request for urine and uh, and blood sample form. Now, Miss Martinez, earlier you were present when I gone over all the requirements that the New Mexico Racing Commission must adhere to for the collection, storage, and shipment of split samples. Were you not? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I was, I was. Did Did anyone give you any kind of sheet, any kind of checklist, any kind of indication that the rules were followed? Uh, no, the only the only the only thing that was handed to me was well, well you know, the box and like I said, the a cop, it, the carbon copy of the New Mexico Horsemen's Association request for urine and blood sample that I did sign when um, when they removed the 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 sample from the uh, from the freezer or whatever from the from the box. It's like a clear box that they handed to you. Miss Martinez, did you ever receive uh, any training? or any indication is what you were to do as a representative of your license, being that you're the licensee of, of how to collect and what to look for when when uh, getting a, a split sample uh, from a freezer? No. Okay, ordinarily, you well, no strike that. Um, I have no other further questions, I'll pass the witness. Hey, Mr. Chavez, Mr. Rubin, read a uh, cross-examination. Uh, no cross, Your Honor. That's fine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Martinez, for your testimony this morning. I do appreciate it. Mr. Chavez, any other witnesses? Yes, I'd like to uh, call Elizabeth Garcia. Okay. Your Honor? Yes, sir. I think, as Your Honor observed a, a few minutes ago, we're doing this backwards. What had happened was Mr. Chavez had rested his presentation and had not called any witnesses. And of course, there's nothing in his petition about any of these issues being grounds for why he might prevail on the merits. But it, I, I think this proceeding is 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 being unfairly prejudicial to the Racing Commission. We would, did not re receive any notice that these would be issues raised by Mr. Chavez. He did not present any in his presentation before the before this court. Um, and if Ms. Garcia, who is present, no wishes to testify, that is certainly Your Honor's uh, prerogative, but uh, I do want to make that observation known. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubin. So, counsel, I think I think I've heard enough, Mr. Chavez. I want to, in terms of legal argument, and Mr. Rubin, I'm going to direct your uh, response in that the um, uh, petitioners have not exhausted their administrative remedies. And I think, Mr. Chavez, if I understood correctly in your opening statement, that um, my understanding of the administrative code is that they are entitled to a hearing before, is it Mr. Trejo or is it in, in front of the entire racing commission? I guess, Mr. Chavez, my question is directed to you. We filed a filed and paid for an appeal of which this is going to be set in front of an administrative hearing officer appointed by the racing commission. We have not received any indication when that's going to happen. And that's why we're asking this court to uh, allow the licensees to enjoy their license until we have the uh, full and final adjudication of that uh, okay. administrative hearing officer. So, and Mr. Rubin, do we know when and when that hearing will be scheduled? Your Honor, that, that hearing is typically scheduled, as Mr. Chavez has said, within within a few months, typically. Uh, it, may, it may be a little bit longer. The, the AG's office has a administrative prosecutor assigned to the case, but we have been put, we've had to put that on hold because of this of this petition. Okay, so counsel, what I am going to do is I'm going to use my inherent authority as a supervising court in mandamus and request that this be scheduled. So the Mr. Chavez, without me having to scroll back, when was your notice of appeal filed? Let me check. I will check for you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the notice of appeal is attached to Ms. Garcia's affidavit. Garcia, okay, thank you. I, I knew I had seen it, but I was looking at Mr. Chavez's yes. petition. So that and was February? Yes. Exhibit A3 reflects that only Ms. Allison Martinez uh, filed an appeal. That was uh, the uh, my initial point, that Christy Rose did not do so. There's no evidence 
that Mr. Chavez has put forth before this court today to the contrary. So there is nothing Ms. Christie Rose can avail herself of at this point. But you I, have I, in that affidavit, I, 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 you have the notice that was provided to both of them, as well as the testing samples. Uh, and, and I think that's all your honor needs. Thank you. It, yes, your honor. I, I tried to address that, but you, you limited me on the scope of my examination. However, one of the very first things that the prosecutor or the state indicated with note, the issue of notice, I'm prepared to show, and I wanted to bring Ms. Elizabeth Garcia on to show that the only notices regarding any kind of uh, adjudication with the stewards hearing were all addressed specifically to Allison Martinez. There was nothing addressed uh, regarding any notice or any findings uh, with the trainer. So I don't know how we would have appealed something that she never received any notice for. However, for purposes of this TRO and preliminary injunction and going forward, we will certainly add her. But the notices specific, and I tried to ask Mr. Trejo, but the court limited me uh, on the notices. They were just to Allison Martinez. So I don't understand how the Racing Commission can say that the owner of the horses is enjoined and has, has waived her appeal when she had never received any notice that any adjudication against her was was uh, had been found. Your Mr. Honor. Hold on, Mr. Okay. And, hold on. and Mr. Chavez, I, I do see your, your point. I think these are issues that need to be developed before the hearing officer. Uh, and I do see in terms of, I'm looking at the um, affidavit of Ms. Gar Investigator Garcia. So I think that's, you know, once again, a merits hearing. But Ms. Rubin, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, Your Honor. Yes, I have to, I, and I am sorry for interrupting, but it is Exhibit A3, Ms. Garcia's affidavit. There is the notice. It lists both of them. Now, they both live together. It's the same address. But they, but Mr. Chavez is not properly representing the facts to the court. What we have before us in Exhibit A3 is a notice to both of them. She, so, Christy Rose had the same notice. The, the proper notice that Allison received, and they both apparently live together. I don't know, Mr. Chavez is in Exhibit A3. I, I don't know where he's coming with this with this new argument. It's not based on anything in before the court. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Hold on, hold on. And Mr. Bitt, Exhibit A3, uh, Ms. Investigator Garcia's affidavit? Yes, I would share my screen, but I'm having a little difficulty with that at the moment. I apologize, Your Honor. No worries, because I'm scrolling through it now and I'm seeing licensee, licensee, licensee. It's it's the it's towards the end. It's Exhibit A three. There's A two and A one first. Hmm. Um, my doesn't have the exhibit stickers on it. I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right. Uh, I'm I'm looking at the affidavit that was filed herein, and this was filed on March 29th. And I'm looking at maybe just get, direct me to the page. I'm looking at this. Uh, Investigator Garcia's signature line is on page two. Yes. And then I have the appeal request on page three. And then I have. Um, it looks like a track number, track ruling date, November 8th, and it says licensee. Um, Martinez, Allison, Judith. If you, and Your Honor, if you give me a moment, I'm tracking down the, um, I'm tracking down my copy of the file document. So Your Honor, you do have exhibits A1 and A2? Um, I, I don't know, because they're not, there's not exhibit stickers on any of the documents. I thought there were. I apologize. And, and, and there might be. There might be. And that's why I just want to make sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. It's the last two pages of the document, Your Honor. Um. The the last two pages I have would be these are sixteen pages. Is that where we're looking at the same thing? I hope so. <laughs> um, page sixteen looks like it's the um, certification by Investigator Garcia. If I may, if I could, I think I have someone at the commission who can share their screen. I'm having some technical issues here. 
No worries, Mr. Rubin. And like I said, I don't mean to complicate, but I just want to make sure that I'm tracking correctly. Okay. Um, if I could have, I believe it is on, it, it might be on page 13 of 16. Uh, Ms. Gar if I could have Ms. Garcia share it on her screen, the notice. Absolutely. Ms. Garcia, are you there? Huh. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Okay, I found it. I'm it here. <laughs> I apologize for the the technical inadequacies, my technical inadequacies this morning, Your Honor. No worries. Okay, I do see. It's the New Mexico State Racing Commission, Sutherland Park Racetrack, notice of hearing date January 31st, 2024. And it does have Ms. Allison Martinez, trainer, and Ms. Christy Rise. It has Rise Martinez, owner, minor yes. accident. Okay, gotcha. Here. So they received notice of that hearing, Your Honor. Both of them did. Okay, okay. I so going back to my original um, ruling, so I guess, Mr. Martin, Mr. Chavez, I think uh, this matter is not ripe. I think in terms of the administrative process uh, needs to be exhausted before the uh, court can use its inherent authority for injunctive relief. Mr. Rubin, my question to you is, I, I know this could take a couple months. Here we are a month in. Typically, how much time does it take to have this matter scheduled for a hearing before the hearing officer? Your Honor, I I do not know the answer to that question. I other other than what I've stated, which is it's typically at least a few months. But that's we can if Your Honor wants to give us a deadline of ninety days, uh, and I don't speak for the administrative prosecutor. That's my limitation before you. No, but I we, understand. We do it as quickly as we can. Okay. Mr. Chavez, I want to make sure that your clients are afforded all due process under the administrative code. Uh, I will note that we are approximately 30 days out from when the notice was filed and approximately, uh, I lost it, let me go back. I just had it, there we go. So January 30th. So we are approximately 90 days out from the ruling date of January 31st, and then a little over 30 days from when the notice of appeal. So Mr. Rubin, I'm gonna request that this matter be scheduled on or before April 28th. I think this gets us 60 days out, but that gives the commission 90 days from when they um, rendered their decision. And Mr. Chavez, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dismiss the uh, petition at this point, but it will be dismissed without prejudice. And once the administrative uh, process um, has run its course, then at that point, the matter would be ripe for administrative review uh, by a district court judge. Thank you, Your Honor. But uh, may, may I address some of the issues that were brought up that I think are pretty serious? You may. Uh, Your Honor, to implicate and I'm sure it was done on mistake that uh, I misstated anything to the tribunal. This court is is inaccurate. I would agree that there was a notice that was sent to Christy as well as um, Allison Martinez. However, if I could share my screen to show the court why I'm making the argument that uh, there was no ability to exhaust remedies on behalf of the owner, which is uh, Christy Rose, uh, I'd like to show the court why why we're making this argument and the evidence of, of how we're making this argument. You may. Okay. All right. Is my screen shared? Yes, sir. Okay. This is the ruling from the hearings now what was shown to you earlier was a notice of hearing for a january um, these are these are rulings that were sent to the licensee from the racing commission that had to do with the suspension and such the licensee is specifically shown here is allison judith martinez in reference to a ruling date on 11 a i'll skip ahead once again this is licensee allison judith martinez 11 8 allison judith martinez Licensee Allen, Allison Judith Martinez. 
And once again, licensee Althan Judas Mart Martinez. These are all, this is the ruling on the final outcome. This says, uh, if you see my screen right there, final outcome. This is the final ruling that specifically affects and triggers the time to file an appeal, uh, Your Honor, with the Racing Commission. And this one specifically lists the licensee is Allison Judith Martinez. All it says is uh, Christy Rose Martinez is the owner of record, but it doesn't indicate that any notice went out to her as to whatever adjudication that the Racing Commission may have reached. So the basis for my argument that Miss Christy Rose Martinez should be allowed to race her horses is because a notice of, of uh, her hearing went out to her. An entry of appearance was filed on my behalf. We adjudicated the hearings to the fullest extent and we received a notice of the outcome of those. However, the only notice that went out to either of the licensees was Allison Judith Martinez as indicated in my screen right here. Uh, it says ruling type 2023 Zia 9 final outcome. Your Honor, no Mr. Chavez is testifying again as to what and, went out. And Mr. Chavez, I, I appreciate and I don't think there was any disparagement of, you know, the, the state of the record. Um, in all honesty to both counsel, I probably let this go much further than what I should have just because this is my first hearing. And honestly, I find this kind of fascinating. Um, so, Mr. Chavez, I think these are arguments um, are well taken. But at this point, I think they're more appropriate for the hearing officer. Depending on the outcome of the hearing officer, then your clients always have the opportunity for uh, injunctive relief uh, at the district court level. So I think in terms of the notice, I think that's something that needs to be developed at the uh, hearing officer level. Right, but but my, my argument, Your Honor, is how does the Racing Commission have jurisdiction over the owner in this instance in which there's no indication that she has anything to appeal? Your Honor, let me object to the continuing struggles of Mr. Chavez to keep this thing alive. And Mr. Chavez, once again, I think these arguments uh, may have merit, but these uh, arguments need to be flushed out at the at the administrative level. So I'm request I'm ordering that this matter be held on or before April 28th. Um, I think that's well within the um, established guidelines of the uh, Racing Commission's based on Mr. Rubin's representation to the court that it takes a couple months. I don't want this delayed anymore. I think this your clients have waited for their day in court, but they do need to exhaust their administrative remedies. Um, I guess the issue, Mr. Rubin, I think what Mr. Chavez is getting at is that um, Christy Rose, that her notice of appeal be timely filed with the hearing, be deemed, is that, Mr. Chavez, is that maybe what I'm understanding your argument, that Ms. Christy Rose be, her notice of appeal be timely filed with the um, hearing officer? No, I don't have anything to appeal, Your Honor, because there's been no adjudication on Christy Rose's behalf. Your Honor, that's, we don't need any more testimony today. Mr. Chavez is testifying as to what Ms. I'm not Christy testifying. Rose hold on, hold on. Hold on, Mr. Rubin. Uh, let me hear from Mr. Chavez. So I, Mr. Chavez, just maybe so I'm understanding, is if I understand Mr. Rubin's argument is that Ms. Christy Rose Martinez is a barred from any appellate relief because she did not file her notice of appeal. Ms. Rubin, is that your position, your client's position? And it is also our position, yes, Your Honor, it is also our position that she did receive a similar set of paperwork as did uh, that Ms. Allison Martinez received. Okay. And that will be developed in front of the administrative prosecutor. Okay. So once again, my naivety of the process and Mr. Chavez, I think it's important that for Ms. Christy Rose, that her appeal be deemed timely filed. There's a notice requirement that she did not file a notice of appeal because there was a notice issue from the gaming commission to specifically Christy Rose Martinez. Is that, that is, your argument? That is correct. Okay. So counsel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, use my inherent authority. It seems like there may have been some confusion. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I am going to order that Ms. Christy Rose's um, be included in the hearing and that she have, Mr. Chavez, you will file a notice of appeal uh, by the close of business day today. It seems like a relatively easy form. Assuming you're representing Ms. Christy Rose Martinez, I don't know if there's an, an ethical issue or whether you have been retained in that matter. And I don't know if Ms. Uh, Christy Rose is present. Um, 
and I mean no disrespect, but Christy, are you here? No, she's not. Um, it's I'm Allison, and I'm her mother, so I'm oh. in for her. So, Mr. Chavez, it has been represented to the court that you represent uh, Allison and Christy. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay, so Mr. Chavez, I'm going to require that you file the the notice of appeal uh, by the close of business day today on okay. behalf of Ms. Christy Rose Martinez. And that her uh, notice of appeal be deemed timely filed based on this issue of notice. But I think um, this will give her approximately, depending on when the Gaming Commission can set that hearing, approximately 28 days from today's date to develop any arguments that she may have uh, regarding the uh, ruling from the um, steward. So there's going to be kind of a compromise as it relates to Ms. Christy Rose Martinez. My only question to that, Your Honor, is is it is required in the New Mexico Racing Commission's rules and anytime we file appeal, specifically what we are appealing and why, I don't have any findings against Christy Rose. I don't know what I'd be appealing. Well, it appears that it would almost be an, the identical appeal that was filed on behalf of Allison Martinez. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's separate um, requirements or separate causes of actions for an owner and a trainer um, i honestly i don't know so i guess mr chavez do you need you know i will require that you file a notice of appeal and analogous to a docketing statement within seven days of today's date to okay. mr rubin does that sound uh reasonable to your client and to the gaming commission your honor we certainly will as part of this order we will we will under, we understand that the that if miss christy rose files a notice of appeal today it will be deemed as timely filed my understanding is that it's the same form and that she did receive i'm not going to testify but uh, and I, I would ask your honor that if there was some if there is a basis for for her failure to exhaust administrative remedies that can be developed in front of the hearing officer that the administrative prosecutor be allowed to develop that and as, as you say if this order if this is being dismissed without prejudice then i would think that it would be without prejudice to us raising to the administrative prosecutor raising that issue of failure to exhaust absolutely at this point everything is back on the table i'm just in all honesty, rewinding the clock in the interest of fairness to both the licensee and the trainer. Thank you, Your Honor. Nothing further here. So I guess just so we're clear, Mr. Chavez, um, notice of appeal by the end of the day, and then seven days to develop you know, a statement of issues that may be uh, separate from uh, Christy Rose and Allison, if, if there are any, but it seems that they're arising from the same cause of action and from the same conduct from the Gaming Commission. But I'll leave that to your discretion how you wish to proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Chavez, um, anything further before we adjourn? Nothing further. We'll uh, we'll get down to the Racing Commission to file our appeal post haste. Okay. And Mr. Rubin, if I could please call upon you or uh, to prepare an order from today's hearing, dismissing this matter without prejudice with what the court ordered in terms of how it relates to Ms. Christy Rose Martinez. And if you can circulate that to Mr. Chavez for his review and approval. Um, Mr. Rubin, how much time would you need to get that order uh, drafted and circulated? I'll get the order drafted today, sir. And also, Your Honor, and also I will include the four, the April 28th deadline. Is that your intent? Yes, sir. That'll be perfect. Okay. All right. Mr. Rubin, anything further before we adjourn? Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, counsel, I want to thank you for your presentation this morning. This was educational, and that's why I love my job. I'm always learning something new. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for their presentation and testimony this uh, morning. If there's nothing further, matters adjourned. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Your Honor.